Let's go. So the heart is a muscular pump, right? Its purpose is to drive the blood through two parallel circulatory systems, right? A pulmonary circulation that, that takes blood through the lungs, dumps off CO2, picks up oxygen, and a systemic circulation that takes blood up to the head and upper extremities, as you see sort of here, all right, and to a whole bunch of uh, consumers, shall we say, down below the heart, all right, all your, your uh, uh, um, visceral organs and your lower extremities, all right. So we've got uh, the pulmonary circulation, a low pressure system because the blood going out to the lungs obviously is, is uh, doesn't need to be in, in especially high pressure because the lungs are proximate to the heart. They're right nearby. All right? And a high pressure system in order to get the blood to flow uh, throughout the system. Again, rule of thumb, how hard, how hard does the heart need to pump? Just as hard as it needs to, right? Meaning as hard as it needs to to get the blood to complete the circuit with a minimum of pressure left, right? So by the time it comes around uh, in the big veins, draining back into the heart, there's one or two millimeters pressure left, all right, which is almost nothing, just enough to make sure it comes back round, all right, and completes the circuit, all right? We're going to see the, the uh, presence of valves, two pairs of valves or four valves total that prevent backflow in this system, and we'll take a look at... Uh, at um, what is responsible for the actual contractile activity of the heart. And we'll come, come back to those things, all right? So we looked at the location of the heart last time in the mediastinum, uh, sitting between the lungs, center of the chest, behind the sternum, and we described it as an upside-down triangle. So we, call, we look at the base of the heart as the top of the heart and the, the point of the triangle, the apex of the heart down below. All right, and um, we described the surface wrappings around the heart, the pericardium, which could be subdivided into a fibrous pericardium, which is, you know, dense irregular connective tissue. It's a sheath that goes over the heart and um, serves to uh, limit the extent to which the heart can be filled, and it serves to secure the heart in its position. All right, so that's the, the fibrous pericardium. It attaches itself to the base of the heart, and then inferiorly it splays out uh, onto the diaphragm. All right, and so it forms this little containment space. Uh, it cover any of the no, it's this isn't it isn't attached to the heart other than uh, at, at its at, at the base of the heart. But beyond that, it's like a curtain falling over the heart, but it's, it's dense regular connective tissue. And then the serous pericardium, which is a serous membrane, all right? And we've said that if we think about then that the, the space, uh, the mediastinum, and we think about the heart dropping down into it, what happens? As the heart drops down into it, this is deflected down. Eventually, as the heart drops into it, we end up with That, right? And th there, there is your what? Your pedal and your visceral layers, all right? And this is the, that's the pericardial space, which is what we often refer to as a pericardial cavity, as a, as a potential space, right? Any of these spaces, right? Your, your, your body cavity here is a potential space. Why isn't it a space? Because there's stuff filling it up. Right, so it's only a potential space, and that that is also a potential space. But of course, the heart displaces that the, the space that's there. And don't forget, you know, that serous membrane. And serous membrane is what? What's its purpose? Yeah, to reduce friction. You know, when you think about what's happening with your heart, your heart is actually doing a a rotating motion. All right, literally, as it pumps, it's actually undergoing a little rotation, and that has to do with the muscle fibers, which are literally spiraling around the organ, all right, in various arrays, but so it actually does a little rotation, all right, when the heart is, is contracting. All right, if we look more closely then at the wall of the heart, we can uh, identify three layers. Now we're 
So here's your fibrous way out here, all right, and then we've got our two serous layers. And if we look at the one that's in closest apposition, let's go up here first, all right. So there's your, what, parietal pericardium, and here's your visceral pericardium right up against the heart muscle, all right, and in between is your pericardial cavity. We just described that, all right. And the visceral layer, the visceral pericardium, is the same as the uh, endocard or the epicardium. All right, is the same as the epicardium. Okay, one and the same. All right, and um, so we have uh, a serous membrane with some areolar or connective tissue, and beneath that you may have varying degrees of adipose tissue as well. All right, especially in those parts of the heart associated with the with the uh, coronary circulation, all right? And, um, and then deep to that, of course, the heart muscle itself, the myocardium, uh, thickest on the left side rather relative to the right side. And um, heart muscle, all right? That is striated muscle, and we'll look at its microscopic structure in a second. And then the lining, of the, of the chambers that are formed in our, in our four-chambered heart. The lining is an endothelium, which is continuous with the endothelium of the blood vessels entering and leaving the heart, right, as well as areolar or connective tissue, okay? All right, so when we look at the microscopic anatomy, we're looking at cardiac myocytes, all right? And these are cells that have a branched uh, appearance, and in this branched-like appearance, they are striated in this way, all right, and they are connected to neighboring cells, all right, all right, and so forth, and single nucleus, sometimes once in a while two nuclei, but they're striated. What does striated tell us? Versus smooth muscle. Contraction can be rapid. Right, remember, we talked about striated versus smooth muscle. Both are capable of generating a lot of tension, right? Smooth muscle can generate some tension, but it's going to mount that tension slowly, all right? Striated means the, the myofibrils are, are aligned in register, and it allows for very rapid contractile activity. And, of course, that's what you want with the heart, right? You want to generate that pressure, which means squeezing it really hard and fast, okay? Um, these are linked together. These, these cardiac myocytes are coupled uh, by way of, um, of what are called intercalated discs. And intercalated discs are junctional complexes that include um, desmosomes, so uh, uh, mechanical connections, as well as gap junctions, all right? So the intercalated disc has two kinds of, of junctional components, all right? Desmosomes, which are for mechanical connection between cells, and gap junctions, which are what? They're communicating junctions, all right? And it is by way of those communicating junctions that the heart muscle is able to behave as though it were a syncytium. Remind me what a syncytium is. Skeletal muscle is a syncytium, is an example of, but what is a syncytium? So the, the definition of a syncytium is when you have a fusion of cells into one giant cell, right? Skeletal muscle cells are a syncytium. Each skeletal muscle cell or muscle fiber is a syncytium. It's a fusion of cells so that you have one long, you know, plasma membrane that used to be many cells and it has many nuclei inside of it, all right? When that big fiber contracts, it all contracts uniformly because it's one big, huge muscle fiber, right? That each of those cells, all right? Here, they only have one nucleus. So they haven't fused and shared their cytoplasm, but they behave as though they have. All right, and that's why we call it a functional syncytium. It behaves as though it were a fusion of cells. And how is it able to do that? It's able to do that by virtue of these gap junctions which allow the transfer of 
information, the signal, if you will, from one cell to the other to the other, so they are electrically coupled with each other, and therefore they behave as though they were one giant cell. All right, and that's critical, obviously, to the functioning of the of the heart. Okay, now T tubules. Remind me what those are. T tubules are extensions of the plasma membrane down into the cells themselves. All right, the T tubule system here is not as extensive as the T tubule system in skeletal muscle, but then the cells themselves aren't that large either. All right, but it's just an extension of the plasma membrane. And you remember what its purpose is? It's to carry the impulse into the cell so the entire cell contracts uniformly instead of sort of contracting from the outer part and then in, in more inwardly, right? Okay, so uh, T tubules. Um, striations. We've talked about that. You have that uniform arrangement of myofibrils. It allows for rapid contraction. So, yes, they are striated. And surprisingly, not very much sarcoplasmic reticulum. Remind me what its function was. Storage of calcium. Remember, remember skeletal muscle contraction was all about sequestering calcium ions and the impulse across the neuromuscular junction over the, the plasma membrane, the sarcolemma, down the T-tubules brought about the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And remember, calcium was the, the coupling agent between excitation and contraction, right? Well, oddly enough, there isn't very much sarcoplasmic reticulum in skeletal muscle. And you sort of go, huh, why is that? It's, it's muscle, it needs calcium, it is the uncoupling agent, or the coupling agent, rather. Well, it turns out that, that uh, cardiac muscle cells store most of their calcium outside of the cell. All right? The cells of, of cardiac muscle cells have a network of carbohydrate molecules on their surface. It's called a glycocalyx, a term that many of you have taken in microbiology and learned about a glycocalyx on the surface of bacteria, right? a carbohydrate, sometimes protein, layer on the outside of bacterial cells. Well, heart muscle cells have their own version of that, and that traps the calcium on the outside of the cell, right? And it's the same deal. It behaves the same as a sarcoplasmic reticulum. Impulse leads to calcium coming across the plasma membrane instead of leaking out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And during relaxation, guess what? You're pumping the calcium back outside into that, into that glycocalyx out there. All right, so it's the same mechanism, but it's just arranged a little differently. All right, as we've said before, these cells have intrinsic, intrinsic contractile activity. All right, and as we've said, you can grow these then in a petri dish and they will pulsate. All right, um, and if we try to classify this on our rubric of slow twitch, fast twitch, or red fibers versus white fibers, remember? All right. Heart muscle cells are more akin to the red muscle fibers, which were what? Slow twitch, high or low endurance? High endurance. A lot of mitochondria or very few? A lot, right? Super aerobic, high numbers of mitochondria. There's over a thousand mitochondria in a, in a cardiac muscle cell, all right? Over, think you know, you, you, when you guys draw your pictures of the cell, you maybe draw two mitochondria and you're done, all right? We're talking a thousand mitochondria in a, in a heart muscle cell, all right? What does that tell you about its aerobic capacity? It's super aerobic. In fact, your heart has very little capacity for anaerobic metabolism, all right? Like those white muscle fibers, they're really good anaerobic specialists. They're going to make a lot of lactic acid, but they can do really quick activity for short bursts. The heart is the exact furthest extreme at the other end of the spectrum. So much so that if you deprive it of oxygen, even a little bit, the cells are damaged, all right? Which is the basis of a, of a myocardial infarction, right? Of a heart attack where you have a focus in the heart that is de deprived of oxygen. That's number one. Number two, as an aerobic 
uh, tissue, it metabolizes fat, all right? Which is kind of ironic, I guess, in a way, because when you think about the heart and you think about fat, you think about, well, that's, you don't want those two mixing. Wrong. The heart, 90% of the, of the energy that's consumed by the heart muscle is fat, okay? And fat, because fat is super efficient. If some of you remember from physiology, or maybe you haven't had that, how many kcals of energy do you get by metabolizing carbohydrate? It's around four kcals per gram, all right, whereas fat, nine kcals per gram. So here's an energy requiring tissue functioning aerobically. It's going to choose to metabolize fat, okay, and your heart loves fat, all right, as, a, as an energy source. But fat, may, I didn't make this connection, and for many of you it didn't make sense. Fat can only be broken down aerobically, all right, and for those of you that have had your glycolysis and Krebs cycle in your classes, hmm, yeah, hmm, no, but for those of you that have had that, all right, fat doesn't go through glycolysis, fat plugs in at, um, at the beginning of the Krebs cycle, all right, and you know that the Krebs cycle only functions in the presence of oxygen, all right? So, so they metabolize fat, and that means the muscle can only get its energy through aerobic metabolism, okay? But it means that it has incredible endurance. And um, how often does your heart take a day off? Like never, right? <laughs> Needless to say. So there you go. Okay, the external anatomy of the heart, um, if we work from... a uh, looking at sort of the, the most prominent features here, we have the, uh, the two chambers, the atria, which are receiving chambers. Again, I've embellished this photo with various arrows that were probably more than you needed on there, but I just was bored in my office, I guess. So we've got arrows that are showing you the flow of blood, and you've got um, blood returning then into the atria. The atria here sitting at the base of the heart, all right, We'll call it the top of the heart for the moment, all right? Like a couple of dog ears up there, all right? They look just like my dog's ears, just flapping up there on the top of the heart. Hence the name oracle, which means ear, all right? And the walls of the atria are really thin. Um, really thin, what does that mean? It means about a thickness of, uh, of a little thicker, than, maybe like two of your handouts put together, all right? Of, you know, the stack of hand, like 10 pages or 12 pages, all right, maybe, maybe 20 pages, all right, if you want to pick on me a little bit, all right, but still thin relative to the wall of the, of the ventricles. And why is that? Because the atria are simply going to contract to top off the ventricles. They're just contracting to the very next door chamber, right? So you don't need a big, thick muscle, all right? So they sit atop the heart, and the ventricles obviously make up the vast bulk of the... Uh, of the, of, the, of the organ, right? So this is all ventricles down here, all right? And we're separating then the atria from the ventricles by a little groove or sulcus that runs around the heart, sometimes called the atrioventricular sulcus, this little groove that runs around the heart, sometimes called the coronary sulcus, all right? And, um, and then the uh, right and left ventricles are separated by an inter ventricular sulcus, again a little groove that runs between these on the surface of the heart and again coronary arteries take their course by running in those little those little sulci, okay? Um, Alright, and, and let's just take another quick look here as we identify the great vessels then, alright, and the great vessels are all these big beautiful vessels that are plugging into the organ uh, starting on the right side of the heart with blue blood, that is blood that's low in oxygen. Coming back from the head and upper extremities, we have the superior vena cava. Coming back from everything below the heart, we have the inferior vena cava, both draining into the right atrium, all right? And draining the right ventricle, we have the pulmonary trunk, all right, giving rise to the pulmonary arteries as it bifurcates here and goes right and left towards the right and left lungs, okay? So there's the pulmonary trunk, all right? On the left side of the heart, we have blood coming back from the lungs via the coronary, or via the, the 
The, thank you, the pulmonary veins, all right, shown in red because it's high in oxygen, but it's blood returning back. And here we see it from the posterior surface. There you go, your pulmonary veins. You can have two of them or you can have four of them, all right? There's variability there, which is interesting, all right? Um, and then, of course, blood leaving the left ventricle via the, the aorta, all right, the aorta. And this, is, this here is called the arch of the aorta, right? So you have the aorta here, and it is you know, replete. Has anybody ever seen an aorta? And what color was it? It's white. Yeah, it's white. What does that tell you? A lot of elastic connective tissue. It's so dense in elastic connective tissue that it actually is, is white, all right? So that tells you something, right? And what did we say? It is receiving that bolus of blood and expanding to absorb the shock of ventricular contraction, absorb the shock of systole, and then recoiling to maintain blood flow during the relaxation, the ventricular relaxation state or, or during diastole. All right. Um, if we look at the internal anatomy of our four-chambered organ here, again, we're looking at it from the front. So this is the right atrium, all right, the right ventricle. The left atrium is sort of around the back side, so we're only seeing a little bit of it here. And here's the left ventricle here. And we see that these chambers, the atria and the ventricles on both sides, are separated by valves, atrioventricular valves. All right, on the right side, three cusps. On the left side, two cusps. All right, those two cusps, when they're closed, come together like this, and it looks like the hat that the Pope wears, which is called a mitre, and hence, it's called the mitral valve, all right? If you've ever heard that term, mitral valve, all right? That's synonymous with the left atrioventricular valve, all right? And these valves are um, connective tissue uh, with, with an endothelial covering. And to prevent them from prolapsing, from blowing back as the ventricles begin to contract and generate pressure, you don't want these valves to blow back. You want them to, what, prevent backflow so blood can drain from the atria into the ventricles, but you don't want blood to reverse, to regurgitate, and so you have these valves. And to prevent them from backflow, you've got these tendinous cords anchoring the margins of the cusps of the valve down to muscles here in the, um, in the ventricle. These are called papillary muscles, all right? And they prevent, they contract uh, when the ventricles are contracting, they too are contracting to prevent the, the valves from prolapsing, all right? Um, and that's true on both the right and left sides of the heart, okay? Um, again, looking at the, at the right atrium, um, we see the, the superior vena cava coming in here, all right, in terms of landmarks. We see the inferior vena cava draining into that. We see a little depression here that you can put your thumb in into that little depression and it would fall asleep right there, all right? And that's called the fossa ovalis, all right? It's a remnant of an embryonic aperture between the right and left atria, all right? I'll talk about it at the end of our lecture tonight, all right? But that is a little feature. There's an, actually a hole between the right and left atria so that if you think about it, during your embryonic and fetal development, there's no point in the right ventricle sending blood to the lungs because the lungs aren't doing gas exchange, right? So you only want to send enough blood there for the lungs to develop properly, but they're not functional in terms of as a respiratory organ, right? And so blood comes into the right atrium from the vena cava and sneaks across this hole into the left atrium, therefore bypassing the right ventricle, all right? And that hole, as I'll show it to you again later, is called the foramen ovale, all right? When you're born, a little flap comes down and closes that, and scar tissue forms and seals it up, all right? And you're left with the little fossa. Fossa, you know, is what? A little depression, right? A fossa ovalis, a little oval depression, all right, and that's just a scar remnant of that, okay? Um, all right, what else do we see here in terms of landmarks? Again, our, our four chambers, we've talked about the valves, 
you can see here in cross section the, the right ventricle and the left ventricle. Which one holds more blood? Of course, it's a trick question. Of course it is. Yeah, they, can, they absolutely have to hold the same volume, right? Otherwise, one side of the heart's going to get ahead of the other side. Yes? All right, right. They absolutely have to, I know, they have to hold exactly the same volume of blood, all right? And they pump exactly the same volume. Otherwise, you know, think about it, all right? You know, one side's going to get ahead of the other, all right? You don't want that to happen. All right, when we... Um, when we remove the atria, we can look down on what's called the fibrous skeleton of the heart. And you see it here, and it is essentially a framework to which the heart muscle is attached. And, you know, here you think about muscles and you think about your skeletal muscles. They're attached by tendons to your bones, as we've seen before. Here we have an organ that isn't attached to bones, all right? And so we need to give it some framework so the heart muscle itself is attached to this uh, dense irregular connective tissue fibrous skeleton, which sits here at the top of the ventricles. It is also the anchor point that, that uh, sets um, the position of the valves, all right? And so you see it here uh, as the fibrous skeleton into which the atrioventricular valves are there, and I should have mentioned, but now I, I will, and these, these two valves here, the semilunar valves, all right? That is valves that prevent backflow. Let's go back here for a second. I should have noted these earlier. Here you see one of the two sets of semilunar valves, all right? And what does semilunar mean? It means half moon. And if you look at the cusps of these valves, they look like half moons, all right? And they prevent what? They prevent backflow out of the pulmonary trunk back into the right ventricle. And likewise, there's one over here as well at the base of the aorta that prevents backflow from the aorta. Think about that. A the aortic one is really impressive, right? Because what happens when the ventricle contracts? The aorta expands and then it recoils, right, to maintain blood flow. Well, when it recoils, it's also pushing blood downwards, right, back towards the left ventricle, right? But the valves shut, all right? So if I were to ask you, you know, what, what makes those valves close, it's blood sitting back down or heading back down toward the ventricle and it fills the cusps like little bags, little parachutes, right? And they, they are slammed shut and that's, that's one of the two heart sounds, right? And, and I guess it's a good moment to, to, to at least introduce that. The heart sounds are the closure of valves, all right? The heart sounds are the closure of valves. The first heart sound is the simultaneous closure of the atrioventricular valves on the right and left sides. And the second heart sound, right? Your heart is two sounds, right? Here it is. <laughs> two sounds. First sound, simultaneous closure of AV valves on right and left sides. Second heart sound, simultaneous closure of the two semilunar valves, all right? The pulmonary valve and the aortic valve, all right? pulmonary and aortic. All right, so now you got it? All right, so when you're auscultating, when you're listening, all right, to the heart and you hear this, that's, a, that's the guy that was next to you at the stoplight. No. What is that? What's happening there? Where's the leak? It's a leaky valve, right? You're hearing backflow, and if it's... It must be what valve? One of the semilunar valves. Which one is sustaining the biggest pressure? The aortic. So it's aortic insufficiency, all right? But if you hear... It's an AV valve again. Which one? Probably probably the one on the left side, all right, again, because you have pre more pressure on that side. So you have leakage in between the two heart sounds, and so it's a leaking of the, of the uh, mitral valve. We call that mitral insufficiency, all right, mitral insufficiency. Okay, so there's our, our uh, skeleton then. Uh, um, we've said it's an anchor for the muscles. It's a, it's a stabilizing, stabilizing the position, if you will, of the heart valves, and its other function is it insulates 
the atria from the ventricles. And what I mean by that is that as the atria contract, it's a wave of electrical activity going over the atria. And if you didn't have that fibrous skeleton, in theory at least, that wave would continue down the ventricles and you'd blow the tip off the bottom of the heart. Right? You'd blow the apex, yes, off, right? Because the wave of contraction would just continue from the atria down, down, down. No barrier there. Electrical activity continues down. All right? But instead, you have the fibrous skeleton, which insulates. The wave of excitation then goes down and it stops. And you'll rely on a separate conduction system to get that stimulus down to the apex so that contraction can be from the apex upward, right? The heart is doing this, right? Atria contracting to drive blood into the ventricles. Ventricles contracting to drive blood up out of the, the pulmonary artery and the, and the aorta, right? It's not doing this, right? Pumping both things downward. The vessels are up top, right? So it's atria pumping blood down into the ventricles. Ventricles pumping blood upwards through the two big uh, arteries leaving the heart, the aorta and the pulmonary artery, right? So we'll look back at that in a moment. This is just a quick cutesy diagram to show you the uh, location of the heart valves and the points where you would listen to be able to detect any irregularities in those heart valves. So it's just a diagram and you see here in blue then, uh, you, if you look carefully through the background of this figure, there's the heart and here's the, here's the valves that we just talked about. There's the right atrioventricular valve. Um, left atrioventricular valve, the valve at the base of the aorta, the valve at the base of the pulmonary trunk. And if you want to hear these valves and be really uh, looking for any insufficiencies, this is where you would put your stethoscope at these yellow points here. All right, just something to look at. All right. That's, that's what we're talking about. Yes, leaking heart is, it, valves is heart murmur. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It isn't like your heart murmuring like, grouchy or something, you know. No, it's leaking valves. Okay, all right. So, the coronary circulation. What did we say a moment ago? The heart is very aerobic, all right? And so it has a spectacular blood system, all right, to supply the muscle itself. We're thinking about, you know, you think, well, there's the chambers of the heart. They're full of blood. Why doesn't, why doesn't the heart just get its blood directly from the blood that's passing through the chambers? Uh-uh. It has its own blood circulation, all right, the coronary circulation. And the coronary circulation on the arterial side has its origins at the base of the aorta, all right, just above the cusps, all right. So if this is there, here's the, um, the left ventricle, here's the atrial ventricular valves and on the left side, okay. Um, and the, the left ventricle is going to drain, uh, I'm getting myself into trouble here, but, but um, if this is the aorta, let's just get to the important stuff, all right, here's the aorta. You're going to have the cusps of the aortic valve here, we're good, and the, the origin of the coronary arteries is right here, all right. Right coronary artery, left coronary artery. All right, and why are they positioned there? Because when blood, watch this, during ventricular systole, when the ventricle contracts, blood opens up the valve, blows out here, the aorta swells, and now the ventricle's done. This recoils and blood is pushed that way on recoil and it's pushed this way on recoil which closes the valve, and so where's that blood going to go? Into the coronary arteries. So perfusion of the heart muscle through the coronary circulation occurs during... during... diastole, when the heart's relaxing, right? You contract, you get paid for it. You contract, you get paid for it. All right? Do the work, then you get paid. All right? Or I don't know, maybe it's getting paid first and doing the work. I don't know. But anyway, it's not getting paid at the same time it's doing the work. It's in between, right? It's during diastole, all right, that it's getting, 
getting its, its, its blood. All right? And that blood then goes through those two coronary arteries and let's follow their course, at least at the beginning. All right? If you look at um, on the right side then, you have the right coronary artery, which goes around through this little groove here called the coronary sulcus or the atrioventricular sulcus and wraps around, all right, you, it wraps around the, the, uh, the organ, okay? And on the left side, on the left side, there you see it, all right, its origin again at the, at the base of the aorta. And this is the left coronary artery, but it bifurcates, all right? It subdivides into a circumflex, which also goes in the, in the atrioventricular sulcus, around from the other side. And these two come around the heart then and anastomose with one another. The anastomosis isn't as impressive as I always would like to have thought that it was. All right? But they do come around. All right? And so we say that these are functional end arteries, which is to say that they have a dead end in capillary beds, all right? which is sort of true, except that they actually do connect and does that mean that if I cl close off one, blood can come around to supply from the other side? In theory, but the amount of blood isn't great. And so if you do have a um, closure of a blood vessel due to the buildup of plaques and so forth, you cannot rely on the other side supplying it, and hence people have heart attacks. All right, but it does give you a little bit, and I suspect that just because of the, the structure of the organ and so forth, that circulation is more about balancing the volume of blood going to all the parts of the heart than it is about a rescue system in case there's a, 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 um, an occlusion somewhere. All right, but it is, it is they, hence functional end arteries. There is an anastomosis, but you wouldn't know it, all right, is, is sort of the point there. All right, um, on the left side, so what have we done so far? The right coronary artery went around the right side. All right, the left coronary artery bifurcates and gave us a circumflex to go around the right side or the left side now. Right, so we've got a band, like a waistband, going around the heart. Okay, and then we've got the anterior interventricular artery coming off the other branch, uh, coming off the left. So here it is coming down. All right. And sometimes we call that the left anterior descending, the LAD, all right? It's the, in your textbook, it's the anterior interventricular artery. And if you put those three together, it's like the heart is wearing a G-string, right? Okay, there you go, okay, right? You've got the circumflex around one side of the waistband and you've got the, the uh, um, right coronary around the other side and then you've got the LAD coming around, all right, down to the apex of the heart, again, in the interventricular sulcus, all right? Of course, these are sending little branches into the heart muscle itself, aren't they? They're sending little branches, smaller arteries and arterioles, and then capillaries that are perfusing the heart muscle, right? So they, it's not just what you see there, that's the big stuff, right? And out of that, you're branching smaller and smaller branches go into the muscle itself. That's why they sort of disappear there because they're paying out their, their volume eventually going in, in these capillaries. Eventually those capillaries within the heart muscle reconverge into venules and into veins and there you see the veins on the, on the other image here and you've got on the left side the great cardiac vein here. Great because who's getting you know, the lion's share of the blood? The left ventricle, the one that's working the hardest. So you've got uh, the great cardiac vein. On the posterior side, here uh, through the transparent image here, you see the middle cardiac vein. And here on the right side, you see the, the small cardiac vein. And all of these dump into a vein that comes around, again, also in the atrioventricular sulcus. And that big vein is called the coronary sinus. All right, and the coronary sinus drains into the right atrium, the perfect place for it to drain, right? That's where your blood that's low in oxygen is coming from the superior and inferior, inferior vena cavae, and the coronary sinus drains in there as well. So, ha, huh, there's three blood supplies, if you will, coming into the right atrium, isn't there? Superior and inferior and 
the coronary sinus, which is draining the coronary circulation. Okay? And the coronary sinus is, is a landmark that we're going to come to right now. All right? Because we're going to talk now about the, the impulse that initiates contraction of the heart. When the heart is developing, I've told you that you can grow heart muscle cells in a petri dish and they pulsate. All right? Some pulsate faster than others. All right? And the fastest ones are the ones that are going to entrain the rest of the organ. All right? And it turns out that as the heart develops, the fastest cells are the ones sitting right near the coronary sinus and they are called the sinoatrial node. All right? And you see it up here in the posterior wall of the right atrium near the coronary sinus, hence the name sinoatrial node. All right? And it's a node of cells that have the fastest pace. They are setting the pace then for the rest of the organ. All right? And then you might say, well, what if I were to shut off those cells or destroy them in some way? Guess what happens? Well, what happens when the guy that's leading the race trips and falls? Somebody else takes the lead. Somewhere else in the organ, some says, I think I'm going to take it over. And, I'm gonna, and that's, those are called ectopic foci, all right, where the organ starts to be controlled by other parts of the muscle. And, of course, that completely disrupts the efficiency, right, because we need to have the organ contract top down, then tip to top, right? And so you start to throw that off and the organ doesn't contract properly. So here's the sequence, all right? We have contraction, or we have an impulse initiated here at the sinoatrial node, sometimes called the cardiac pacemaker. It sends down a wave of electrical activity over the atria, and, um, and so the atria undergo contraction, okay? Um, from there, that, that wave of, of electrical activity is picked up by the, a second uh, center, which is called the atrioventricular node, all right? So another node of, of special uh, pulsing cells, all right? And they pick up that impulse, delay for a moment, and then initiate an impulse or convey that impulse down through a special conduction system. Here are these conduction fibers going down in the interventricular septum, the, the wall that divides the ventricles. This is called the bundle of Hiss, all right? The bundle of Hiss, or um, sim sometimes the interventricular bundle, all right? And it subdivides into right and left bundle branches, again, carrying that, that impulse that, that initiates contraction all the way down to the tip of the heart where that signal is transferred into special heart muscle cells that are called Purkinje fibers, all right? And those cause contraction then to be initiated from the apex upward, all right, through the ventricles. So the, the first impulse beginning at the sinoatrial node causes contraction of the atria. That signal is picked up by the AV node. There's a delay. What's the purpose of the delay? To allow the atria to fully contract, top off the ventricles. Now that signal's carried down, bundle of Hiss, right and left bundle branches to the apex of the heart, and then from the apex, the PNG fibers carry that impulse upwards and initiate contraction of the ventricles from tip to top, right? Upwards, all right, contraction to push that blood up and out of the pulmonary trunk and out of the aorta, all right? And so that's what's shown on this figure, and I think I'm going to Leave it at that, all right, on that figure there, all right? So, contraction of the, of the heart is intrinsic. It is initiated at the SA node. It is not the result of neural stimulation, of nerves that are innervating the organ. However, the organ is innervated, all right, and you can, you can alter the heart rate, both hormonally, like adrenaline, you just drip some adrenaline and it will cause the heart to beat faster, all right? Or you can alter the, the um, rate of, of contraction via the, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. And, and I'm not going to belabor this. It's an interesting figure that I hope you'll take a little time to look at. For right now, I'm going to cut to the chase on this because I want to finish. Um, you see here from the sympathetic side, 
you've got um, sympathetic fibers coming in via the cardiac nerve, and we'll talk about this other wiring uh, next time or on next Tuesday. All right, here's the cardiac nerve coming in from the sympathetic side. It's sometimes called the cardiac accelerator nerve. Now you know what it does, and it 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 um, it uh, innervates uh, both the atria and the ventricles, all right, to speed up contraction, all right? And then likewise, on the parasympathetic side, you've got the, the tenth cranial nerve, the vagus, all right, coming down and, and having the opposite antagonistic effect, all right, to slow the heart. And as I told you before, the heart beats at 90 beats per minute, roughly, all right, as a result of its intrinsic activity, Parasympathetic slows it down to its current rate of 60 or 70-ish, all right? If I remove parasympathetic stimulation, it's like lifting your foot off the brake pedal. I'm not giving it gas, but I'm lifting my foot off the brake pedal, which means it's going to move towards 90, all right? And then if I want to go beyond that, you'll start to introduce sympathetic stimulation to get it above its intrinsic rate, all right? So one can say that the parasympathetic and sympathetic allow for an increase in heart rate, but it, it's really, as you remove sympathetic, it starts to speed up, and then you continue speeding up as you in, introduce sympathetic stimulation, all right? Okay, so the last thing we're going to look at here is uh, the cardiac cycle, which is to think about the sequence of events. We touched on it to varying degrees, but let's, um, let's try to wrap it up. And I think I'm going to, with apologies, I, I, you guys don't have this figure. It, I will put it online, all right? But, but I'm going to use it to introduce this, and then we'll come back in a second. So let's take a look. I like this figure better than the one that's in your text. That's why I threw it in here. All right, and here it is. We're going to look at, to start out, we're going to look at the cardiac cycle as three steps, all right? And you see them here. Um, if your heart beats at 70 beats per minute, it means it's beating a little bit faster than once per second, right? If it's beating at 70 beats instead of 60 beats, it's beating a little faster than once per second. So as you see on this figure, the entire cardiac cycle is taking what? 0.4 plus 0.1 plus 0.3. It's taking 0.8 of a second, all right? Half of that both the atria and ventricles are rel relaxing. So half of the cardiac cycle is atrial and ventricular diastole. All right? This is a period of passive filling. Blood is coming back to the heart, all right? coming back from the body into the right atrium, coming back from the lungs into the left atrium. It's passing through the atria, through the AV valves and trickling down into the ventricles filling the ventricles to about 70% capacity, all right? Passive filling occurring during atrial and ventricular diastole, all right? The next part, a tenth of a second, is atrial systole. The atria contract to top off the ventricles. Now we've got 100% fill ventricles, all right? So, atria contract, they top off the ventricles from 70% passive fill to 100% total fill, all right? And then, the last three-tenths of a second, the ventricle begins to contract, all right? Here it comes now. As the ventricle begins to contract, pressure's going up in the ventricular chambers, right and left sides, right? As the pressure starts to go up, the AV valves... Make sense? As blood starts to get pushed upwards, the AV valves close. <laughs> First heart sound. When's it happening? Early in that third phase, early in ventricular systole, AV valves close. All right? Ventricle continues to contract, generating pressure, blows open the aortic and, and pulmonary valves, blows open the semilunar valves, and blood is ejected. Right? Blood's ejected now and the ventricle, ventricles ring themselves out. There's no more pressure, and so the blood comes to sit down on the semilunar valves, right? Second heart sound, all right? So first heart sound is occurring early in ventricular systole. Second heart sound is 
the period at the end of the sentence, right? The very end of ventricular systole, right? So, there's your heart sounds, loved up. What are those two heart sounds? Early in ventricular systole, AV valves closed, first heart sound. Then there's a little gap in between. What's happening there? The ventricles are doing their job, right? Ringing themselves out, generating high pressure, pushing the blood out, and when they finish that job, no pressure, so blood falls back down and closes the semilunar valves, boom, second heart sound. We're done. Ready to start passive filling again. All right? Okay? So, um, I think in the interest of time, I'm not going to go back and dissect this figure for you. It's exactly the same thing. All right? Um, likewise, this figure here. All right? It's exactly the same thing that I just described. I've given you a little more detail here showing you where the heart sounds are. Why don't you mark that on your figure? It's what you know, right? It's uh, right at the end of what? Here's atrial contraction, and we're just beginning to contract the ventricles here. There's your first heart sound, and there's your second heart sound there. All right, so um, uh, go ahead and review these figures, and they're nicely laid out in your textbook with it, you know. And I'm going to recommend, by the way, why don't you renumber these and call this number one? All right, renumber them. Start here with the atria relaxed because it makes sense. Let the heart fill. All right, let's start here. Number one, then number two. All right, you, you following me here? And then numbers three, four, and five across the top. All right, so one down at the bottom right hand corner, then two, then three, four, five. Same sequence, but I'm just starting at a different point. It's a cycle. All right, it just makes more sense to start down here. All right, uh, just after the period in the sentence. So just after the dub, all right, then you start as the ventricles, be, as the atria begin to fill, all right, the valves open and go from there, okay? Last slide real quick then. <clears throat> I already described this to you. I said that during your fetal development, you don't want to be sending blood down into the right ventricle because that blood would be pumped to the lungs and there's no point in pumping a lot of blood to the lungs, all right? So during your fetal development, there are two bypasses, two shunts that redirect blood flow away from the lungs, all right? And here they are. The one I've already told you about, all right, it's this little window here called the foramen ovale, the oval window. And so blood coming back from the superior and inferior vena cava comes into the right atrium and passes a little goes down into the right ventricle. We'll deal with it in a moment. But most of it goes across through this opening into the left, vent, uh, left atrium, from the left atrium into the left ventricle and back to the body again. So we're, we're bypassing the lungs. Got it? But some does go down into the right ventricle. All right, and again, it's destined to go here, if we jump across here, it's destined to go what? Out of the pulmonary trunk, isn't it? On its way to the lungs? Well, there's another bypass, all right? And that other bypass is called the ductus arteriosus. It's a connection between the pulmonary artery and the aorta. How perfect is that, all right? So you have this little connection here between the pulmonary artery and the aorta so that blood, again, is shunted away from the lungs, all right? When you're born, hut, 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 here it comes, all right, born, all right, slap them on the bottom or whatever you have to do, <sighs> big breath, right, first breath, all right, oxygen levels in the blood go way up, all right, unprecedentedly high oxygen level, all right, relative to what mom was sharing, all right, and that change causes the ductus arteriosus to clamp down, all right, to close off, all right, and it closes off, and when that closes off, the pressure that results from that closing off, what happens, guys? You get increased pressure, ah, sorry, I can't go back, all right, so you have to look at your figures. So that increased pressure backs up into the right ventricle, and that backs up into the right atrium and closes the door 
on the Foramino Valley. All right? So if you're ever in the uh, delivery room and they do that first breath, be listening. Door slams shut. Now you can't hear it, really. All right, all right. But there it is. And, and when those close, the, the ductus arteriosus closes, it stays clamped, and what happens? Scar tissue forms, and it becomes the ligamentum arteriosum. All right? And the little flap of tissue called the... The little flap of tissue is called the... I think it's called the septum primum. I, is, is my recollection of it. But anyway, it's a little flap of tissue that closes over the foramen ovale and it, when it closes over, the pressure in the right atrium is high enough that it keeps it closed until, again, scar tissue forms around it, sealing it shut. All right? And as you know, it's not uncommon, well, it happens often enough, that infants are born with a patent foramen ovale, meaning it's still open. And you have to, and they can go in very early in the life of that neonate and and touch that up, right, and, and repair that without. Nowadays, I think that's a pretty straightforward surgery. Hmm? It's it's con, it's congenital, but it can be repaired. Yeah, it can be repaired.